Hello everyone and welcome to the final live Q&A with me, Michael Scott. It is the 17th of August. I hope you are all well and that you've all been well looking after yourselves over this both rainy and extremely hot summer, depending on where you are in the world. So we are here with our final set of questions that we're going to get to answer as we delve for our half hour into the ancient world and to all the joys and wonders that it can bring. So as ever, thank you very much for your questions that you've been sending in for this Q&A as well as for all the Q&As that we have done. We are on Q&A 112 um, since we began back in 2018. 112 Q&As um, and the questions just keep getting better and better. So without further ado, um, I wanted to start delving in first off to a question that's come in from Kim and Bella uh, Wong. My 11 year old, Bella, and I've been watching a series about uh, the BBC series about Atlantis dating back to 2013. Uh, and they're on series two and they've got some questions regarding oracles. Um, so uh, kind of the Queen of Atlantis is getting married and the oracle took part in a ceremony to see whether the gods bless the union. Is this something? Thing that ordinary people had to check with the oracle before they got married in the ancient world. Well, Kim Bella, yes, indeed. In fact, um, oracles, we kind of think about oracles, that kind of way of in finding out what the gods intend, particularly in the ancient Greek world, as sort of being something that maybe only states or cities or leaders did before they went into battle or whether before they kind of made a massive civic decision or a new foundation, perhaps. But actually, when we get down to it and you look at the vast range of oracular sites spread out across the ancient Greek world of different kinds, you would never be very far away from a place where you could consult the gods in some form. And people thus could do it on a regular basis about all sorts of day to day things. And in fact, when you start to look at those more kind of ordinary day to day oracular sites, the questions are about work. They are about love. They are about justice and revenge. And marriage is absolutely fundamental to those questions. So uh, Dodona, for instance, the Oracle of Dodona in northern Greece, we have lots of kind of oracular questions that were asked of that oracle, of which lots are, should I get married? Would it be better for me to get married or not? Is this the right person for me to get married to? Uh, indeed, asking the gods whether you've got the right person to get married to. So absolutely, kind of the Atlantis series is spot on, mm, perhaps not in all of its details in every way, shape or form, but in terms of the oracle, being asking oracles about kind of questions like should I get married uh, and about how will this marriage turn out well absolutely spot on so hello to everyone hello Anne hello Samantha hello Rosie Helen Elizabeth Alexis hello everyone welcome welcome to the last Q&A um, that we will be uh, spending time together enjoying uh, and delving into the ancient world we've talked about oracles um, and uh, uh, about marriages uh, moving to a completely Completely different topic. Sarah Scotty asks, I just went to Specsavers and the software they use for the eye tests is called Socrates. Any idea why? Sarah, this is brilliant. I had absolutely no idea. I've heard of lots of kind of um, big firms calling their sort of software system that's supposed to generate uh, ideas, best practice, solutions, you know, calling, calling them oracular titles, calling it Delphi, for instance, something like that, you know, kind of insight, knowledge, uh, answers to questions. But I have never heard of an eye test system being called Socrates. And it, I mean, Socrates, we don't really imagine him having particularly good eyesight, sort of slightly uh, old, old, slightly portly, uh, kind of in, and sort of slightly squinty, I always imagine Socrates. But maybe it's from the perspective of Socrates looking into your soul, getting under the skin of you as an individual, exposing you and your character. Oh, we lost you for a second because of a bad Wi-Fi. I do apologise. We're back live again. Hello, Samantha. Hello, Elizabeth. And it froze. Don't worry. We're back. We're back, Kitty, Dan, uh, Katrina and uh, Anita. Thank you so much indeed all for tuning in. We are back, hopefully, and hopefully we'll stay that way. So does anyone have any good ideas why the Specsavers eye test software is called Socrates? Is it because it's looking into your soul, just like Socrates was said to do, and to really gird, well, kind of the gadfly, wasn't he? He was known as kind of sting you into realising that you do need those glasses that you've been putting off for so long. So kind of Sarah loved the fact that Specsavers were calling it Socrates um kind of their their system anyone else know of any other brilliant systems that they work with or that they've heard of um, that use kind of ancient names to 
to sum up their meaning and what they're supposed to deliver, do shout now on the chat on the chat um, during the Q&A. I'd love love to hear more. Um, so, Sarah, we're shifting slightly from Socrates to another famous ancient uh, in this question. Uh, kind of, you're missing the clock. A kind of, oh, the, the, the clock. I, I talk to you today from a place I've never talked to you from before. This is my brand new office uh, at the University of Warwick for my new role. I've just been moving into the office uh, this week and starting to get to grips with the new job. So yes, this is, is part of the office uh, kind of thing. But what you are looking at behind me on the right is the gift um, that was very, very kindly given to me by my current team at the Warwick Institute of Engagement team. Uh, and it is a global map for my job, which is kind of thinking a lot and leading on the university's international portfolio and international relationships around the globe um, but the global map is a special one because wherever you go for each country you can actually scratch off the country on the map and it shows up as a different color underneath so I can slowly over the next couple of years chart my journeys uh, around the world and of course we will occasionally post up what the map is looking like um, to the Facebook group as we continue to share through the Facebook group going forward um, our love for the ancient world so let me make that very very clear I know too much change Tracy's saying too much change but don't worry, some things are not changing. Um, the Facebook group will continue apace, um, as will, of course, the wonderful community group that's run by yourselves. So do not worry. And there will still be some space to answer a few questions uh, here and there, uh, kind of through the group and occasionally pop up in different places. You'll see a video from me uh, kind of popping up in the different places I get to uh, where I've discovered some random part of the classical world that just happens to be uh, in the Outer Hebrides or kind of in Iceland or in Antarctica or where wherever it might be. Clive, you don't want to go and tear off your toga. Don't hurl yourself from anywhere. It's okay. All of this, uh, we're, we will continue to be the fantastic family uh, that we have been growing together um, through, through the Facebook page and through the community page for sharing our love of the ancient world. And please don't let uh, the kind of system of the Q&A is getting in the way of that in one bit. Um, before we go on with our next question, I want to take a moment though to thank Claire for being an absolutely superb supporter uh, and kind of uh, doer behind the scenes, creating and helping create the scaffolding around which we all come together on the Facebook page and through the community page and indeed uh, the, for these live Q&As. So Claire, I know you're out there listening. Thank you so very much indeed. And kind of, I think we need to have a round of digital applause um, for Claire. Absolutely. Kind of, if we can show our appreciation um, for everything that Claire does to make uh, the uh, our little world come together. That would be fabulous. Uh, so kind of while we do that, I will move on to a question from Sandy Grant, uh, who's asking about another famous person uh, from the ancient world that you uh, kind of will all have heard of. And that, of course, is Trajan, the emperor Trajan. Yes, indeed. Hello, Leanne. Hello, Debbie. Hello. Yes, indeed. Claire is a star. Well said, well said, well said. Um, so Sandy Grant's question is this. Do you think Trajan was a good emperor? Ooh, it's a tough question because it's never quite that black and white, is it? What is a good emperor when it's at home? Um, now, on the one hand, Trajan gets generally considered to have a pretty good rep in the ancient world. He does pretty well. Uh, and partly, I think that's a question of the time frame in which he lived uh, and uh, then came to rule. Uh, because it's the end of the first century, beginning of the second century AD. This was a good time in Rome had been expanding, it had done all its major wars, it had massively taken over the Mediterranean. It was well on its way towards expanding towards its maximum extent that it would do, kind of Trajan Hadrian. Um, and kind of things were pretty good. It hadn't got into all of its financial crises that it would do in the third century, hadn't started to have all that pushback from the extremities as it grew and grew and grew and grew, hadn't started to sort of have all of its problems of leadership and rulership that many would point to in later Roman times. Um, so Trajan was lucky in some ways uh, that he came at a time when it was quite easy to be a good emperor. Probably people might take up on that. But, uh, you know, at the same time, he clearly knew and did very well the job of being emperor and knew the bottom line of what you needed to deliver. 
Um, so on the one hand, it's big military victories. So his campaigns against the Dacians obviously were his big thing where he proved his might and his worth, expanding the Roman Empire just that little bit further. And of course, then that led to commemoration, most famously in Trajan's column, but obviously also in the kind of rebuild of the Circus Maximus. And then 123 days of games to celebrate his victories. Bread and circuses give the people of Rome what they want. Kind of that's another good way of keeping everyone happy and being remembered as a good emperor. But then also building in Rome Trajan's Forum, kind of really allowing the economy of Rome to kind of take off to a whole new level with this massive, massive intricate built structure to enable the kind of markets to have that that kind of that that sort of that sort of space and that sort of establishment within the city. Big building projects also in the provinces, in different places, bridges over the Danube. Don't forget the provinces. You've got to make sure that they're happy and that they're not getting antsy out on the uh, the, the, the the kind of peripheries. Um, and of course, there were people getting antsy on the peripheries. Kind of during Trajan's time, we had Pliny, who he popped out as a governor to kind of one of those peripheries. And we've got all those letters um, from Pliny coming back saying, oh, you know, I've got a problem with this guy, got a problem with this group, got a problem with this group, with early Christian communities as well. And Trajan clearly in his responses to these letters he's he's navigating a middle course always he's trying to say don't kind of make it black or white don't try and force the issue actually what we want to do here is just keep everyone ticking along that's the way to do it um so trajan in my mind uh sandy comes up as a good good emperor um and long may he be remain so um helen you're asking about the 2024 calendar we already mushed or missed 2023 um yes indeed we didn't get the 2023 calendar out there kind of who knows if there will be a 2024 calendar i will keep you guessing for the moment i haven't quite made up my mind about you know maybe we can we can do one with with shots from different places that i have gone kind of on on the job as it were with the university of warwick we can think about doing that but don't forget that in the meantime there are book plates so you can always get in touch with the facebook page or through michael scott academic at gmail.com to get a signed and and uh, addressed book plate that you can then stick into a book of your choice um, sent through to you. So do, do, do that. If you haven't, hello, Helen, hello, Hamiad, hello, Christina. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. Yes, I am very sad that this is the last Q&A as well, but thank you so much for coming on this extraordinary journey for 112 Q&As um, all together. Um, so Sandy, thank you for your question. Kim and Belle Wong for yours. Sarah Scotty for yours. Um, we've got time to go for uh, one more quick question. Uh, Jimmy Kelly asked, wondering if you and the BBC team have covered Iran. No, we never have in any of our TV programmes. It would be a place I'd love to visit. Never have. Um, may well, may get the chance to do so, but I suspect it might be slightly harder uh, to make to make a documentary there uh, kind of for at least um, a little bit of time in the future. Um, so we may have to put that one on the back burner for a little bit indeed. Now, here's a question before we go to think about kind of what's going on around the ancient world. This is one of my particular favourites. Um, Nassim Akhtar, you've been asking about how did people keep time before clocks were invented? Uh, how did people plan their days if you couldn't time keep? Uh, and more importantly, as Nassim says, what if one had a hot date? And you didn't want to be late. Ooh, kind of, kind of, I love it. I love it. I love it. Good question indeed. Well, kind of calendars, uh, kind of for the, for the time of the year, that kind of attracts either the, the, the movements of the sun, the movements of the moon, kind of the solar day, the solar year, the lunar year, kind of, etc. Um, those have been around going back long, 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 long time to really the kind of earliest major civilizations, communities, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. Um, so really, it seems to have been a fundamental part of the development of that wider community that there was a need to have some kind of agreed way to make sure you weren't late for your hot date and other kind of trifling things, you know, that needed uh, communities to come together to do you know like kind of uh, work the fields and provide all the food etc 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 um but it kind of so so that kind of uh time keeping was there really kind of from the get-go and then of course things started to get more specific for specific 
specific needs and reasons. You know, did you know need to know uh, exactly what hour it was? Perhaps you do for the hot for the hot date, as opposed to just saying when the sun sets, I will see you at the fountain. Uh, it sounds quite romantic, really, doesn't it? Um, but when you needed to start measuring specific amounts of time. That was when a whole different kind of kettle of fish uh, started being brought into play. Not really fish, and there were no kettles involved. But for instance, in the Athenian jury courts, there would be specific uh, vessels made to a specific size and shape that would be filled with water. And then a small hole would be punched in the bottom with a stopper. And that a stopper would be taken out when a person started to speak. Uh, and they had to stop speaking when the water ran out, all being caught in the lower vessel that it was running into. So uh, kind of ways of making sure that everyone had, particularly thinking about Athenian democracy and equality within the law courts, everyone had the same opportunities, everyone had the same amount of time to speak because they used the same size vessel um, each time. So kind of different ways to be able to measure certain amounts of time. But Nassim, if you really wanted to not be late for that hot date where you had to meet specifically at a particular moment, you would have had to wait until 1283, because that was when the first mechanical clock uh, was invented. We had sundials before that, so some moving on from the kind of idea of the solar day and the solar calendar to be able to kind of at least use the sun to be able to plot time going round kind of within the clock face. But actually, if you wanted a mechanical clock that, that could tell time for you, then 1283 was the date um, that you had to wait for. Uh, kind of exactly. So yes, indeed, as well, kind of at least absolutely for different religions, different kind of world cultures, different kind of communities needing to know certain times through the day, um, particularly from religious perspectives, uh, as well as kind of for whole reasons of kind of developing kind of uh, community uh, well-being and also for kind of community get togethers for all sorts of reasons. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, so there we go. You can you can you can pick your time in the past when you want to go on your hot date now. Uh, depending on what kind of clock operation would have been available to you at the time. Brilliant question. Thank you all so much. So let's take a moment just to think about the fabulous things that are going on that have been discovered about the ancient world. One of the things I absolutely love is that you cannot go a week without some new part of the ancient world being discovered. Um, and, and the last couple of weeks have been no exception to that. So from live science, we heard, heard about the Roman aqueduct and luxurious burials that have been unearthed during the construction of an underground parking garage in Serbia. Yes, indeed. In Belgrade, the Serbian capital, uh, this is a place close to my heart. I love, I love a good trip to Belgrade, uh, kind of, and, and had a very, very memorable stag do in Belgrade once, where the stories just must remain in Belgrade. Um, but yes, 14 Roman tombs from the 3rd and 4th centuries uh, have been uncovered kind of as part of this underground parking garage uh, creation. Then on the other hand, Italian construction workers have made remarkable discoveries of a Greek marble statue of Aphrodite um, that's got a particular kind of hair gathered at the back. Aphrodite with a particular kind of hairstyle, I would like that indeed. Um, but on the other hand, uh, in Greece, they are fighting to control the tourist numbers that are desperate to come and see the Acropolis. Yes, the Acropolis is having a bit of a crisis as soaring visitor numbers are overwhelming the site. There have been apparently massive queues at the gated entrance and quite a lot of annoyance and confusion going on, particularly in the heat, obviously, this summer. So they're having to think about crowd control policies. The ancient world is that popular, people. We need crowd control policies. Uh, Helen, could we have a Christmas Q&A and tell us about your new role? Well, you know, maybe that is something that we can think about, that we can come back for an occasional Q&A together uh, to kind of, kind of, reunite around what's been going on on the Facebook page and uh, come together. So we'll keep that in mind. And thank you for the suggestion and for others who have made that suggestion as well. Thank you. We will definitely keep that in mind and fingers crossed that we can make it happen. Um, from the BBC Media Centre, there's going to be a new documentary about Pompeii, The New Dig, a three-part series for BBC Two and iPlayer, promising a Pompeii as you've never seen it before. Um, <clears throat> but then I'm a big fan of shipwrecks at the moment, as many of you may know who have touched my new book, X Marks the Spot, with its chapter on Ulubarun shipwreck, uh, the fabulous shipwreck of, of the ship that was sort of 1300 BCE, travelling around 
and the eastern part of the Mediterranean with tons and tons and tons of cargo on board from nine or ten different ancient global cultures. It, absolutely amazing. But this one is a perfectly on, on an old 2,000 year old shipwreck, Roman shipwreck, um, and it's lying off the French peninsula, peninsula of Cap Cos, uh, between uh, kind of uh, nearby, is a, a glassware, perfectly preserved Roman glassware has been found on the shipwreck, lying 1,148 feet below the sea. Isn't that amazing? The stuff can lie in such a great condition, just waiting for us to be found. Sarah, write a book based on all the questions you've answered. Oh, wow, that would be quite a book, wouldn't it? So bringing all those questions together. I love that idea. I think we, we can definitely try and do something with that in the future, uh, kind of bringing our questions and then kind of some poor person can transcribe some of our kind of answers that we've come up with together, uh, kind of on these Q&As to get a sense of kind of how we've responded. Uh, um, a tiny Roman dog has remained, uh, the remains of, I should say, a tiny Roman dog have been found during an Oxford archaeological dig. Um, this is at Whitnam Clumps in Oxfordshire. They've uncovered the 1800-year-old remains of a 20-centimetre-tall pooch. Um, so because it's one of the smallest ever remain dog's remains to be found in the UK, um, so likely very much to have been a domestic pet rather than any kind of working animal. 20 centimetres, so cute. Kind of, I wonder if they got carried around in a little bag, kind of on the front of the little chariot, so kind of as they went around. Um, so some amazing finds uh, kind of around uh, the country. But also the other great thing about the classical world and the ancient world is that there's always so much on talking about the ancient world for us to get involved in. Um, so there are going to be some chances, despite the fact that we don't have the Q&A uh, coming up uh, kind of on a regular basis. I am going to be out uh, kind of giving talks around the country in September and through the autumn uh, as uh, still talking about my book, X Marks the Spot. So if you've got a chance on the 12th of September, do come and see me at the Gloucester History Festival. I'm on the 12th of September in the evening there. Details are on the Facebook page. Then on the 3rd of October, I'll be up in Warwick at the Warwick Words History Festival. Um, and the day before, on the 2nd of October, I'm interviewing Mary Beard about her new book about Roman emperors at the Brighton Pavilion. So if you can get tickets still, I think, for the Brighton Pavilion on the 2nd of October, if you're down in the south, or come to the Warwick Words Festival on the 3rd of October and I'll see you there. Uh, and then through into 2024, we're already booking into 2024. Uh, on the 25th of April, uh, I'll be talking at the Southport and Birkdale Classical Association on the 25th. And then on the 27th, a double bill in the Northwest, I'll be at the Lytham St. Anne's Classical Association um, for their 10 year anniversary, Ancient Worlds Day, uh, that I'll be involved in and then giving a talk as well as part of that. Uh, so uh, kind of uh, very much kind of keen for you to come together and we can all come together and, and, and sort of be part of that as well. Um, but in the meantime, in September, Lytham St. Anne's is also having its Classical Association's Romans Day. So there'll be a crafts, family fun, Roman dress, lectures, talks and of course cake, Roman cake. Uh, on the 23rd of September. Um, there's also going to be a hybrid event called a Classics for All debate overboard from Classics for All. Uh, so different characters being supported uh, kind of to not be thrown overboard. So do get involved with that if you can. The National Latin Spelling Bee is back. Get your students involved. That will be on the 27th of March next year. Don't miss out on that if you uh, can. Um, and then of course indulge in the lovely kind of podcasts that are out there about uh, the ancient world to uh, enjoy. So there's one about the Ulleborean shipwreck that I wrote about in X Marks the Spot on the Mariner's Mirror podcast um, that is done in conjunction with Sam Willis. Uh, but also on the History Hit podcast, lots of new, great new stuff and particularly the one on Chandra Gupta Maurya, one of the big heroes of Indian ancient history, uh, caught my and should definitely have a listen into that. Um, on Against the Law, they've done a podcast about ancient physics, uh, kind of which you kind of might do your head in, but it sounds actually quite intriguing. Um, and on the Classics podcast, uh, the Classics podcast does careers, things that you can get involved in, where studying the past can take you. And believe me, it can take you absolutely everywhere in one form or another. And then finally on radio, it would be wrong of me to not suggest that you should all tune into Natalie Haynes' Stand Up for the Classics 
season nine, if you can believe it, um, that will be coming to us uh, kind of uh, broadcast in November this year. And I'm told that Natalie is already prepping series 10. There we go, indeed. Um, learn your learning. D, you're learning Latin on Duolingo since the last q and I love it. Great to hear. That's fantastic, fantastic stuff. Keep it up. Go to the Vatican and you can actually start talking Latin to all the priests that are there. That's the way to do it. Absolutely, indeed. So we've got time for just a couple more questions um, before we uh, kind of have to call it a day and bring the sun down on uh, the live q and so at least for now. Um, Darius Macunas, you asked um, about historical romances in the ancient world. Aha. Uh -huh. So kind of it, as it, could you write a historical romance using the information we have about the ancient world? It would be really interesting to read. Would it be uh, kind of who would it be about and kind of you know, what would be your key themes? Well, well. Well, there is. I mean, of course, oh, there are some great romances out there kind of in the historical narratives of just thinking about the Roman world, for instance, Caesar and Cleopatra, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, for that matter, kind of probably more so as great you know, possible romances that lots of films have been made about, books have been written about already. But also kind of within the literature, we often think about those Romans, don't we, as quite hard headed, quite military, quite sort of dry and dusty in some ways. Not not perhaps kind of you know, people who are going to be carried away by affairs of the heart on a regular basis. Would that be fair? But of course they were. There's lots of great Roman love poetry out there uh, where people and Romans complain bitterly about the arrows that love shoots into one's hearts and the uh, the bitter wonder, wonder, the wondrous wonder and difficulty um, that love brings with it. I'm thinking, um, you know, of people like Propertius, uh, obviously Ovid as well, kind of Catullus. Think about all these great love poets, but also think about Virgil, right? Kind of, you know, kind of where he, he comes up with the famous phrase in the eclogues, isn't it? Kind of, kind of where he's thinking about uh, omnia vincit amor, love conquers all, it nos cademus. Let us yield to love, absolutely. So kind of right there in the middle of uh, the kind of Roman world is that great statement that says uh, kind of love is absolutely all powerful and we should definitely all get behind the historical romance story. So let's all go and write a historical romance story set in the ancient world. I think that would be absolutely genius. D's bucket list number 10, talk to a priest in Latin at the Vatican. Yes, yes. Absolutely, it's a wero. Uh, kind of that's the way we want to do it. Um, so yeah, D, and when you've done that, come back with a video recording, share it with us, and we'll definitely put it on the Facebook page. It will be an absolute blinder. Um, so we kind of, and we'll finish off with one more talking about uh, musical and ancient instruments. Marietta Favalora Cardinale is asking about ancient instruments, but do we have, has anything been found to what, uh, vis a vis what songs they played, even music sheets, for instance? Yes, we do. Um, in in different places. I mean, most famously, actually, at Delphi, on the side of the Athenian treasury at Delphi, is actually inscribed a set of musical notation that's a paean, a kind of religious song that would have been sung to Apollo that actually gives us um, the notation. Um, and increasingly, more and more information has actually come to light. And the pioneer here has really been Armand Dangour, who has sort of can, kind of worked through the very difficult complexities of kind of what actually musical notation visiting the ancient world, and particularly the ancient Greek world, is trying to stress. How do we translate that into modern musical notation? How do we do that across the fact that they're working with different instruments made in different ways from the way we make it today? But he is actually, if you search for Armand's work on YouTube, been able to bring together orchestras, small orchestras of people playing ancient instruments um, that can then give you a sense and a flavour of what ancient music may have sounded like. And frankly, it sounds pretty odd. I don't think it's going to be making the top 10 any time soon, I have to say, very sadly. Uh, kind of, but uh, kind of, you know, the uh, kind of, uh, at the same time, kind of, we might enjoy a little bit more, kind of thinking about Greek tragedy, for instance, and all the choruses that were sung in that melodic verse. Uh, kind of, we have some sense of the no musical notation as well for that kind of chorus, um, kind of verses. Uh, and that's kind of more, I think, often appealing to us today as it helps us to kind of understand uh, and really get into that, to the language of these great ancient tragedies. 
Um, so there we go. We've got kind of some great, great, great questions coming in. We are almost, almost out of time. I wanted to say thank you to you all for being incredible stalwarts of the Q&A over the last couple of years um, and for being such such brilliant kind of inquirers and inquisitive people about the past. And what I've really, really loved is not just hearing your questions and helping to answer some of those and kind of sparking off ideas about different parts of the ancient world that we've never thought of before, but the way that you've also come together with one another to build a community of people who are engaging and supporting each other in your likes and interests uh, about the ancient world through the Facebook page, through your own community page. And that is something extraordinary to see. And I take my hat off, my metaphorical hat off to you. Not quite Clive, I'm not quite taking off my toga. I'll take my metaphorical hat off uh, to you all um, to say what an amazing and wonderful thing that really is and long 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 may it continue um, so on that note kind of it has been a pleasure and a privilege to spend these Q&A's with you and we're going to end with kind of one more question uh, which is from Latifa Walken uh, saying when you were writing X marks the spot did you enjoy writing and researching any particular chapters more than the others and what surprised you the most with your research uh, kind of so did I enjoy some chapters writing chapters some chapters more than others yes I, I, I did because some of them turned out to be completely more surprising than I had ever anticipated them to be I, I loved the Ullaburun chapter the underwater shipwreck but actually probably for me the Ice Maiden chapter really was a revelation in terms of the story that has unfolded through the technology but I think in terms of what surprised me most in terms of the individual research was the fact that when you dive down under the water uh, in scuba gear and you're doing underwater archaeology, for every 50 feet you go down, uh, the narcotic effect of the mix of oxygen and nitrogen that you are breathing through your scuba tank has uh, an increasingly powerful effect on you. And divers say that the rough guide of thumb is that for every 50 feet you go down, it's the equivalent to drinking a gin martini. So Ulubaran shipwreck was being uh, excavated by archaeologists working at three and a half gin martinis down. And that is forevermore how I am going to talk about depth under the sea. So there you go. Go and have three and a half gin martinis and then try to delicately uh, excavate something with your toothbrush. I'll leave you with that thought indeed. Thank you all so much um, for being such wonderful people and for being such wonderful, uh, such a wonderful community to be a part of. It's been a joy, a pleasure and a privilege for me. Good luck to you all with everything that you guys are doing. I look forward to hearing about it through the Facebook page. Keep the information coming in, keep the ideas coming in, keep the conversation going and let's uh, see you all again in the future. Until then, take care.